Sociology is interested in where the macro and micro meet, where biography and history meet. And a lot of that happens in families. It's where social structure becomes internalized into our personalities early in life. It's where our most intimate relationships reflect the most important structural features and events in society. For example, we talk about who people marry or how people decide whether to have children. We're interested in inequality or insecurity. People tend to get married when they have confidence in the future. A lot of people choose to have children when they have confidence in their own future, their self-efficacy, when they feel they can shape their own destiny. And that's a component of social structure. If people are getting laid off and housing is unaffordable and healthcare is unavailable and education is too expensive, then they're not going to feel that they can with confidence make long-term decisions and commitments. So that would be how social structure affects very intimate decisions in families. A main indicator we use to study inequality is the Gini index. That indicates the relative amount of income or wealth between rich and poor. In the U.S., that's been increasing for about half a century. The things that are driving that include runaway wealth at the top. And, and although that doesn't affect everyone directly, in the sense that if Jeff Bezos' wealth doubles one year, that doesn't affect me so much, he still has all the money in the world. But, but what happens at a large scale is it ends up corrupting various other aspects of the economy and society. For example, a few companies like Walmart and Amazon dictate wages and working conditions for millions of people. We've created a system where the richest people are making the rules for themselves and everyone else is working around that. We all want Bill Gates to solve the problem of malaria in Africa because he has more money than a lot of governments, which would be great. But it's unfortunate that that's the place we've ended up. At the bottom, we have a weak social floor. How far we let people fall and just what a toll it takes on people with regard to security and stability. Even if they have their basic necessities now, the fact that they could lose them so easily just wears on people, on their psyche, on their health, on their anxiety, their depression, their fears for their children, and the way they interact with their children. Do you want to let your kids be whoever they want and do what they want, or are you just afraid they're going to end up on the wrong side of a yawning gap in inequality? That corrupts everything. So our inability to raise and stabilize the floor is standing in the way of improving life for everyone. I come back to this issue of self-efficacy. That's the sense you control your own destiny, which is something we prize very heavily in modern society. If you don't have self-efficacy, it affects all your decisions and your relationships. Another example, the decline in marriage. When women started making more money and getting more education, which accelerated starting in the 1970s, some people were afraid they wouldn't need marriage anymore. Marriage would decline. Feminism was going to ruin the family by making it so women didn't need men anymore, which all seems quaint now. But in one sense, it could be true. In the 1950s, more than 80% of Americans were married before they were 25. And so it really wasn't even optional. It was practically universal. So increasing people's choices meant there was nowhere to go but down for the marriage rate. If you made it possible for people to opt out of marriage, then some people would, and the marriage rate would go down. What we didn't anticipate was that richer women would be the ones getting married more. And I think the reason is partly that they have better mates to choose from in terms of economics, and men too are increasingly judging their partners based on the economic contributions they can make. One reason that poor people and African Americans are not getting married as much as they used to is the gamble. It's unbalanced. You're making a long-term commitment in a universe that offers you no reason to believe that your long-term decisions will be reciprocated by reality. Even among middle-class couples, the issue of the expense of college, the fear that your children will end up broke, contaminates a lot of opportunities to be fulfilled as people by fear and anxiety. The anxiety contributes to cynicism and materialism where people feel they have a duty to keep their kids on track and getting ahead and it's limiting the range of their human potential. On the other hand, people try to find the realm of their lives that they can gain some control over, and families are part of that too. There is a sense of the family as a haven in a heartless world, to quote an old book, a place where emotional connections rule over material principles and people pull together in hard times and they can trust each other and rely on each other. That's the ideal, and some people get towards achieving that. At the lower end of the class spectrum, that may be achieved by drawing on the wider network, the extended family. 
especially among immigrants, the social family, fictive kin, or who play a familial role, the informal care networks uh, who take care of each other's kids in a pinch. There is a tapestry weaving component to this where people find the connections they can to bolster their emotional support and provide some security in hard times. I said class before, but I want to, I don't want to collapse race into class. If you, if you take two people who are college graduates, mid-level incomes, one white and one black, because of their history and their context, the black person is much more likely to have poor relatives and friends. So people come knocking on their door asking for help. That's much more common in the black middle class. And they're more likely to be less secure in their position and face racism in many aspects of their lives, from relationships at work, to policing, to aggression and exclusion in public places. So it might look similar in terms of class if you don't track the context around families, but you miss a lot of that important complexity. Impression management is everywhere. It's part of the human condition, but it shows up especially in social media. If you go back to the 1950s and where more than 80% of people are getting married before they're 25, you didn't have to justify that lifestyle, that family structure, because everyone was doing it and it was obvious. You have more choices, but you have to justify them to other people and even to yourself. This feeds into the social media mania of presenting your lifestyle. Now this isn't all bad. People can create an image, whether it's a humble brag of look at what a shambles my office is, or the actual brag of the thing I cooked or the clothes I have. By presenting an image of oneself that you can control, people do gain some actual control. Look at the pandemic. With the Zoom green screen, you create a visual context for your all online relationships. So the creation of your own image is something a lot of us have more power to do now with our technology. There's a shallow cynical dimension to that, but there's also a positive side. You can create your own image and that is potentially empowering. Some people believe this contributes to the anxiety among teenagers who might know rationally, but they can't fully grasp that everybody is presenting a positive image of themselves. So they think they're the one who's sad and depressed when everyone is just posting that one minute from yesterday that they were happy or acted happy. You can't tell how much is people sincerely having fun and how much is creating the image of fun. Large shocks have a way of propelling things in the direction they were already going. Or maybe that's an illusion, a kind of confirmation bias where I see what I already believe is there. But everywhere I look today, I see inequality growing. In education, the kids who have computers and devices and Wi-Fi and parents are pulling away from the other kids. And other aspects of family life. Some people are trapped at home, are, but they're having an opportunity to spend more time with their families. Sure, everybody gets sick of it, but for some people it's basically good. And some people are trapped in an abusive hellscape. A lot of our tools for measuring family violence and abuse are only activated when people leave home. So our ability to track this is very limited. But we know that for a lot of people, the idea that you're going to be trapped at home with your family is just dangerous and terrifying. When we think about school for children, that eight hour a day respite of leaving home is so important. Just looking at the window during the pandemic, I can see these yawning gaps in life experience and it's crushing. In terms of family and family life, we are having a huge moment. The people who can stay home, who have enough rooms in their homes for everyone to work and have their own space and computers, they're riding it out. That advantage that already existed is grossly magnified. And while some people are risking their daily lives to do their jobs, or they've lost their jobs, the well-off are literally saving money from not traveling and buying lattes and eating at restaurants all the time. They're getting ready to plop that money down on a tutor or a private pod teacher for the next year. Economic inequalities are worsening as well. When the budget collapses take hold, all the workplaces that are doing without certain workers now, some of them won't come back. Maybe your office will end up without a receptionist or they won't have an office at all, which means building workers and parking lot workers and coffee shop workers will all be out of work. There will be a lot of cuts that become permanent and people will be unequally affected by that. When Ivanka Trump says, try something new, that's not voluntary. Some of the long-term effects of this crisis won't show up immediately. For example, medically, we might find lifetime effects of having been infected by the virus, even for people with cases that look mild now. With the race, ethnic, and class disparities in infection rates, this will be a source of health inequality into the future. In families, 
we don't have the data on this yet, but we can be sure that a lot of people are postponing the decision to have children this year. Birth rates were already falling in the US and a lot of other places. This could be big. Some of this delay will translate into births foregone. Couples break up, people have to start again, people have trouble conceiving at older ages, so on. That might be one indicator, but it can ripple through. Fewer kindergartners in six years, that kind of thing. And it's also unequal again. Who faces the consequences of this insecurity? We know a lot of people have canceled or postponed getting married. How many of those are temporary? Kids not going to camp, not traveling, not making new friends or seeing new things. Today's children will be different adults because of this. What about single people? Are they meeting new people, interacting with strangers? Some of what's happening are the things that aren't happening. And that absence will have effects that we can't predict right now. It's all not even to mention the millions of people who've been infected or lost family members to the disease. How will the prolonged experience of risk and danger change people's personalities or the culture forever? On the other hand, there's every reason to believe that if our political system can function at all, we will get out of this crisis with at least true universal health care and child care and paid family leave from work, at least. Those policies are for a different talk.